Okay, well look, good morning everyone. My name is Bruce Robinson. I'm the Dean of Sydney Medical School and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. Um, it's now Sydney, uh, Sydney time, just after 9am. Um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to you wherever you might be. Uh, what I would like to do this morning is to talk to you a little bit about the Sydney Medical Program um, and some of the issues that we've been recently addressing in it uh, to try to improve it. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about the medical school in the first instance. I'm going to touch on the Sydney MD as we've recently restructured it. I'm also going to talk about a program that we've established called Pacific Bridge. We'll touch briefly on admissions in, in, in question time, so I won't cover the admissions process in this talk today since most of that information is available to you on the web. So a little bit about Sydney Medical School in the very first instance. Our aim as a medical school is to improve the health and well-being of people in Australia and elsewhere in the world by training and supporting compassionate clinicians. Um, not only clinicians but also medical scientists and health professionals whose work will form the basis for advances in health. And through your involvement with Sydney Medical School, uh, we would want to make you one of those um, types of people. The medical school is the oldest medical school in Australia. It was established in 1856 and it is a very large school with over 4,500 students and 14,000 alumni. Not only do we have a large cohort of students undertaking studies in medicine, but we also have a large number of students enrolled in professional um, postgraduate courses and we have over 1,100 students enrolled in uh, research degrees with us. We are a research intensive um, faculty, a member of the group of eight universities, the research intensive universities in Australia, and our research spans the spectrum of basic science, clinical medicine and public health. Um, through largely our research and the quality of our programs, we are recognised as being very competitive, being number 17 in the world for medicine in the QS rankings and number 25 in the world in the Times Higher Education rankings for clinical, preclinical and health. The university is located very close to the geographic centre of Sydney. The university is outlined in this slide um, uh, in yellow. Uh, you can see there are a number of large green uh, spaces where people play uh, football and cricket. Um, and in the distance you can see the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the Sydney Opera House, and in the far distance uh, off the top of this slide is the Pacific Ocean. So um, we are facing northeast uh, in this perspective of the city and the university. So very close to the centre of the city, um, about a 30 minute walk from downtown, which is shown in the slide. Um, you can see the high rise buildings, that's the downtown area. Um, about a 30 minute walk from there out to the university campus. Now, in, one of the reasons we're able to be a very um, successful medical school and, and, to, and be able to train people to a very high clinical standard is because we have a very strong network of teaching hospitals associated with us. Within the city itself, the metropolitan area of Sydney, there are a number of hospitals, some of which have quite famous names, the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, the Royal North Shore Hospital, and Westmead Hospital, are three of our biggest teaching hospitals. And we also have teaching hospitals at Concord. This is an old uh, veterans hospital. Um, and then in the far west of Sydney is an Apian hospital. Um, the children's hospital at Westmead is the largest children's hospital in Sydney. It has over 500 beds and uh, many thousands of admissions each year. And then in addition to um, that, we have a new teaching hospital, the Sydney Adventist Hospital, which is our first private hospital um, that's functioning as a teaching hospital. And this is located in the northern, northern part of the city. In addition to those metropolitan hospitals, we have a rural clinical school, which is based in Dubbo and Orange, um, which are two of the stars um, just to the left of Sydney in this slide. In the very far west of New South Wales, we have a University Department of Rural Health in a town known as Broken Hill, which is a big mining town where a lot of silver and lead and zinc is mined. And then in the far north of the state, we have teaching hospitals on the coast in Lismore, Grafton and Mwoomba, and just west of that in a town called Moree, which is where uh, um, there's a lot of uh, farming takes place. So this very rich network of teaching hospitals uh, uh, are the places where you would rotate to to learn your clinical medicine. And because of the strong links of these teaching hospitals with the University of Sydney 
and the strong um, links that the people, our alumni who work in those hospitals have with the university, we can provide you with really outstanding clinical training. This is um, a, a picture of the Great Hall, the ceremonial space within the university where students graduate. Each year we graduate approximately 300 medical students, um, of, of whom 230 are domestic and 70 are international. Our international students um, come largely from North America, um, but increasingly from Singapore as well and some other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and over 40% of our students in years gone by have come from Canada. Now a little bit about the Sydney MD, which you've no doubt read a lot about. Um, the Sydney MD was started this year for the first year and uh, the change is that we have changed our basic medical degree from MBBS, which is the traditional medical degree throughout the British Commonwealth, to a more traditional North American style of MD. And that MD has a number of um, changes to it that have been uh, introduced this year. The key change is the introduction of a research program. Um, students will actually achieve, uh, be given research training in year one, and I'll show you later on the timetable where that is. And then they undertake a compulsory research project in years two and three, concurrently with their other studies. There has been absolutely no change to our admission requirements, to the number of students, or to the aims of the program, um, or to the aims for our graduates apart from the fact that we are strengthening your ability as a graduate to be able to evaluate research which we all use in our daily clinical practice. The MD um, at Sydney is a four-year graduate entry degree. Uh, approximately 70% of our students have a background in, in biomedical science, but many of our students, 30% of them, come from a range of different disciplines. And this is one of the things that we have um, held to um, since the inception of the graduate medical program here at Sydney. That is that we take students from a diverse range of, of, of backgrounds. Many students come to us with degrees in engineering, um, the arts, commerce, um, business, uh, law, veterinary science, many things other than a background in basic medical science. In years one and two, which are primarily focused on the campus, um, students undertake a very intense period of uh, 10 weeks at the beginning of the program where they, their skills in basic, basic biomedical science are brought up to scratch. So even if you don't have a background in basic biomedical science, don't be concerned because um, that 10 week period gets you up to a standard similar to those uh, of people who have come with a basic biomedical degree. And in the exams at the end of first year, we cannot distinguish between students who've come in with a science background and those who've come with a non-science background. We undertake um, clinical training in um, year one. Uh, it begins from the very first weeks of the course. Um, students spend either one or two days a week in their clinical school um, to which they are allocated when they commence the program. And in those one or two days each week, the, you are taught um, basic history taking and physical examination, the skills which you then build upon as you progress through the four years of the course. The research project, as I've said, is undertaken in years two and three concurrently with your uh, medical studies. Now, as I've said a number of times, we aim um, to achieve several things in our graduates. First and foremost, we want you to be excellent clinical doctors. Um, there's no use any medical school graduating people who can't look after other individuals and solve their health problems for them. We also after you having some experience in research, not that you'll necessarily be trained to be a researcher, for that you would go on and do a PhD, but we do want people to have sufficient understanding of research that they um, are able to evaluate the literature properly uh, uh, in the future. The third thing that we are quite adamant that our students do have is international awareness when they graduate. This is, Sydney is a developed um, city um, and one of the things that we think is very important for your lifelong medical education is that you do have international awareness of the way medicine is practiced in other parts of the world. And through our course we do give you some specific training in that but in addition we offer you opportunities to do some of your clinical training and research training if you wish offshore. <coughs> this shows you um, just an outline of the MD curriculum. Um, it touches on the foundation block that I've mentioned earlier. Subsequent to that, students um, 
rotate through several blocks, each lasting between eight and 10 weeks duration, where they rotate through and learn the basics of musculoskeletal medicine, respiratory, hematology, etc. Um, in each of those blocks, um, what you are taught spans the spectrum from basic science and understanding through clinical medicine and also the public health aspects that are relevant to each of those specific disciplines. In years three and four, <coughs> excuse me, you rotate predominantly through um, medicine and surgery, uh, perinatal and women's health, critical care, community medicine, you do paediatrics, psychiatry, and then you also do um, an elective term and the course culminates in a pre-intern term to prepare you for your um, work as interns in hospitals. Shown throughout the course is the research methods and research project, which is shown at the bottom of the slide. This is a very detailed slide, and the main reason I show it is to emphasise to you that this is a very full program. There are a number of holiday blocks, but they are relatively short. They are certainly nothing like the length of holidays that other students within the university have. Um, there is, at the end of third year, the opportunity for students to have an extended period overseas when they undertake their elective term. And I'll talk about how students who are international can undertake some of their other rotations uh, internationally as well. In stage three, obviously, we can't have all of the students doing paediatrics or obstetrics or medicine or surgery at the same time. And so students are broken, the year is broken into a, a, a number of streams which do these different rotations in a different order. We do try to facilitate the international students doing them in an order which will enable them to do some uh, more of their rotations overseas. Um, so that's something that would happen in, at the beginning of stage three. I've mentioned on a number of occasions that we are a very research intensive um, faculty. Uh, we have six major research themes that are listed down the side of this slide. Um, and as I've said earlier, our research does span from basic medical science through clinical medicine and public health. The specific research strength areas are shown down the right hand uh, of this slide. So for students who are coming to us with a background in medical research who do want to pursue it, there will be opportunities for you to do some concurrent research work during the course. Ideally, of course, many of you would make that the subject of your research project whilst you're doing the MD with us. There are some students who enter the program having part completed either a master's degree or a PhD. And we do try to uh, accommodate students completing such research degrees whilst they are with us. I've also talked about the importance of international um, exposure and experience. Um, to facilitate that, we have a number of um, uh, external programs, and we encourage all of our students to gain some international experience whilst they're with us. We have a number of um, relationships with affiliated hospitals in, and, and universities in both the developed and the developing world. Um, in Southeast Asia particularly, we have strong links in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Laos, in Myanmar, in Timor-Leste, and in Indonesia. We also have strong links in, uh, in Shanghai and, Hang and, and Hong Kong. Um, we also, of course, have strong links to institutions that many of the faculty have worked at um, when they were training in North America uh, and also in Europe. And we do facilitate opportunities for you to undertake exchanges to some of those countries. We have very specific exchange arrangements um, with Johns Hopkins University, with the University of Toronto, and also with a, a university in the south of California. Um, and those relationships have, have meant that we are able to have formal exchanges that uh, have some of their students coming to us during their training and some of our students being able to go um, there. These are limited in number, um, but, they, but they are very good and highly sought after. The majority of students, as I've touched on, do spend their elective block at the end of year three and beginning of year four, gaining um, clinical experience in an overseas site. Some of these are affiliates of ours and others are, are um, organised by students themselves. Um, and as I've touched on, our international students are permitted to undertake approved substitute terms or exchanges in, country, in their country of origin um, to help facilitate them being exposed to people who might be able to write references for them so that they can subsequently go back to um, particularly Canada, North America or Singapore um, subsequent to graduation if that's what they want to do. 
To help um, facilitate this, we've set up a program which is called Pacific Bridge, and there are two components of this, um, largely aimed at North American students who wish to secure positions in the US or Canada once they have graduated. There is a flexible study program which enables some of the students to, to do a rotation in their home country. And there are three ways in which you can do that. The first is to do your elective term um, in your home country. And then you are permitted to do either one specialty or core block and your pre-internship term in your home country. And all of that helps you to um, get exposure to the sort of people who I've said might write references for you to enable you to go back home if that's what you want to do. Uh, this year, for the first time, we've also provided assistance with students preparing for the USMLE. And that assistance was in the form of a boot camp that was run by colleagues from Johns Hopkins University. And they have agreed to run that again this year. And whilst this year we did it in January during the um, summer vacation, we are going to do it this year uh, in December, just before, um, just before Christmas. And uh, I'm pleased to say that our colleagues from Johns Hopkins have agreed to help us with that uh, as well again this year. This was a very, very popular boot camp and um, we believe has been of great assistance to students who have been preparing for the USMLE. Pacific Bridge, this simply outlines, and, and this is all available on the presentation which will be made available to you if you've been participating in this webinar. This, this just outlines what the rules are around the blocks, um, both specialty and core blocks, and your elective and pre-internship terms um, with regard to when you are able to um, go and do a rotation or what blocks you're able to do these rotations in. Um, as you can see, community medicine is a very popular specialty um, uh, core rotation, especially rotation back to particularly Canada and Nor North America, but we are gradually expanding these so that students can even do core rotations um, in medicine and surgery uh, and critical care um, in some of these partner hospitals. This is the USMLE boot camp in action with Fred Wondersford, who's a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins. Um, running that course for our international students. This was a very intensive three-week course where students studied from dawn to dusk. I think they had one day off in the three-week period, but they certainly all found it extremely valuable. There may also be questions that you have regarding the internships. Um, unlike in North America, internships are not controlled by universities in Australia. They are provided largely by the public hospital system with a small number of internships now being available in the private sector as well. There are unfortunately more graduates than there are internship positions. And so with some assistance from the federal government, um, additional internship positions were created um, in the private sector for this year. Uh, in the end of last year for students um, who are going to become interns this year, I am pleased to be able to say that all of our international students who wanted an internship were able to obtain one. Um, it took quite a bit of negotiating at the end, but um, some of them have actually got internships which are really very attractive, involving some of the time being spent in a private hospital and some of the time being spent in a public hospital. And in fact, um, you should understand that in Australia, a huge amount of surgery is undertaken in the private hospital sector and so you'd actually have a, a better experience, many would argue, doing part of your internship, particularly the surgical part of your internship in the private sector. And the subject of internships and further specialty training, what we're referring to as the pipeline of training, um, is the subject of uh, high level discussions that we uh, have with the federal and state governments at the moment. This is just the timelines for um, applications for 2015. Um, all of the dates are listed there. Uh, and if there are any specific questions about any of that, then that can of course come up in question time, which I'll now um, open up. Um, okay, before I do open that up, we actually have um, Boris Waldman, who's one of our third year medical students at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, is going to give us a, a, a bit of a talk on his experience as a medical student. So Boris, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'll just be about five or 10 minutes, just give you an overview of who I am and uh, how, I, how I've enjoyed the program so far. 
So my name's Boris, I'm 25 years old and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Sydney and I'm based at RPA Hospital. Now, when I entered medicine, I didn't come from biomedical sciences background. In fact, when I entered medicine, I only knew one person in the program. And the first thing that I really enjoyed about this program was just how easy it was to meet new people. I found that both the faculty and the medical society organised a whole array of events ranging from drinks on the very first day to a medical camp to a buddy system, which allowed me to meet people really quickly and in no time I felt really included in the course. I really enjoyed the structure of the first two years. As it's probably been mentioned, there's a lot of focus on self-directed learning in the first two years, which means that there is quite a bit of spare time or free time in which to organise your own activities. This meant that I was still able to take advantage of the time to meet new people, including making many friends from North America and Canada. And one thing that I think that is really nice about this program in particular is just the extent to which the international student body is integrated with a local student body and the extent to which we're all friends and also the solidarity that we've showed between the local students and international students on issues such as internships. The second thing that I liked about the self-directed program was the opportunities it gave me to pursue things such as research and global health in the first two years especially. Last year I did some research in diabetes and cardiology and the highlight of that was being able to present at the American Heart Association in Dallas last year. The faculty was very supportive of me for the whole time with scholarships and grants and even allowing me a week off in order to do that in November last year. I've also been able to engage in global health through the help of one of my supervisor who runs a a uh, diabetes related charity and that saw me in India for three weeks at the end of last year and again the faculty was very supportive of that. The other thing was that I was able to pursue interests outside medicine. Me and a few of my friends were able to join the gymnastics society at university last year for example which was a lot of fun. So I think that with the first two years the real impression is that you have so many opportunities to do things but at the same time it's not overwhelming and you can still pursue your own pursuits outside of medicine. Now, just quickly, I'm in my third year currently, and it is a bit busier. However, I still have time to continue some research and my engagement in global health. Furthermore, I really enjoy the clinical engagement that we get in this third year. I found all the supervisors at my hospital, RPA, to be very open to students keen to learn, keen to stay back, and to get more the most out of their hospital experience. And once again, I still do have some time outside my clinical commitments for other interests. For example, I'm currently learning Spanish so I can undertake my elective at the end of the year in South America, which is again being organised with the help of the faculty. Just briefly, in terms of general life um, at Sydney University, found it a really enjoyable university to study at. As you would have seen on the map, it's located very centrally. The general area in which you'd call it would be the inner west, and this is where there's a lot of student housing and a lot of um, apartments and share houses. In the time I've lived in Stanmore, Newtown, and currently in Redfern, which are three suburbs around the area, they're all really enjoyable um, to live in and really easy to um, commute to university as well as to the city for other non-medical engagements. So I hope that's just given you a brief uh, snapshot of um, what it's like to study at this university. As I've said once again, I think there's a really good balance between self-directed learning and also opportunities to engage with wider fields of medicine, including research and global health. So I'll hand back to the Dean. Okay, so look, we might actually open up to questions now. Um, if you could type your questions in, then um, someone will read them out to me and um, between us we will attempt to answer them. Okay, so look, while we're waiting for questions to come in, it's just been suggested that I might actually 
um, touch on some of the types of research project that, uh, that we might develop here. What we've decided to do is to divide the year up for the purposes of the research project into about 30 groups of eight to 10 students each, with each of the research groups having a particular theme. And the research, the person who's in charge of each of those groups, a research tutor, will then help direct students to individuals who might be able to more closely supervise a project in an area of their interest. Now, um, the range of projects will span from just about anything you can imagine in clinical medicine, right through um, public health, ethics, medical education, global health. There will be a, a very broad range of research areas from which students can make their choice of a of particular project. Obviously, the more uh, interested you are in the project, the more passionate you are about the project, the better the experience is going to be. And so we, we do hope to be able to offer students um, a project that's as close to their area of interest and choice as we possibly can. I'm waiting for people. There's some people typing questions in now. They'll probably all flood in in a moment. We can see questions emerging. Yes, so Lily, you might want to answer that question. Lily, from our admissions office. So let me introduce Lily Lee, who runs our admissions office. Hi, I'm Lily. Okay, uh, regarding the question about the deferment, a uh, student is possible to defer, however, there are some conditions. A student can only allow to defer if they are undertaking an honors year or a master degree or PhD or some like internship, for example, for the a pharmacy student. And also, um, you may be able to defer if you have some exceptional circumstances, and that would be considered as well. Thank you. We certainly don't allow students to defer just to travel the world. Um, if you have a really good reason for wanting to defer or you're continuing some research that's relevant to your subsequent medical career, then that certainly would be permitted. Next question, are there scholarships we don't have scholarships for international students in our program, but what we do have is some scholarship support for students to help them with their elective terms. We actually have about 70 um, scholarships available to help people with um, small stipends of, of the order of $3,000 to enable them to get to um, other countries and to support themselves whilst they're on their elective terms, but there are no actual tuition scholarships for students in our program. So all of the students who wanted to match to a residency in their home country did so in 2013, I believe. So we'll, we'll email the results of the match back to you. Um, as I said earlier though, all of the students who wanted an internship here in Australia last year got one, um, and I'm told that over 70% of the Canadian students matched back to Canada um, if they wanted to. But we will email the results of the match out to you. And, and unless the students who have graduated from us tell us whether they've matched to a medical school in the United States, we, can't, we don't have data on that. We do know of some of our exceptional students. One of them, for example, has just secured an internship at the Mass General Hospital in Boston, part of Harvard Medical School. Um, she is a student who has done very well, did very well in the US MLE, and so was very successful. Um, does the university offer joint MD and PhD programs? Yes, we do. We offer students the opportunity to um, break their medical studies at the end of year two and to undertake full-time study towards a PhD. 
We also offer students who are part way through a PhD the opportunity to break their PhD, to, to break their medical studies and complete their PhD or master's degree by research if they want to. So Lily is going to come and answer this question. What, the question was, what was the entry requirement for students with a foundation in health sciences stream? Okay, basically, um, there is no prerequisite for this course to get into the medicine. So you can study anything. So students have a science or health science background actually will be treated equally, the same as students studying arts or, or law or engineering. Okay, for the GPS, we will calculate um, all subjects from your undergraduate degree. And of course, there are some um, different issues, different situations, like a student may undertake a um, combined degree, and we will calculate all the subjects. And also for international students only, and also for this year, as a continued trial, um, if you have undertaken a master course, um, that will be a coursework will be considered as well. Um, just in the event that you didn't do well in your undergraduate degree and you have another chance, your master by coursework will be considered. So um, for this, is um, we have information on the website in the admissions guide and then there's a link. We have the guideline for the how to calculate your GPA. So you can have a look and look carefully. And if you have any further questions, you are very welcome to contact us. And we will send you the link and also send you the contact details. So it will be good if you have any question, you can contact us directly with your specific, your individual case. We can answer to you. Thank you. Um, we don't actually offer a joint MD MBA program, but um, if a student was to want to do such a program, we could help um, liaise with the business school, the Sydney Business School, to actually help make that happen. We have had students in the last couple of years that have done a joint MD-MPH um, or MD-MIPH program, and we are keen to expand that, and I think we would do so on an individual basis with students undertaking the, the, um, the MBA part-time. Um, concurrent with their medical studies. The other issue about these concurrent master's degrees that students undertake with the MD is that of course there's no absolute requirement to complete the two degrees at the same time. Some students who have undertaken the master's of public health degree have completed three quarters of it at the time they complete their MD and during their internship because a lot of this coursework is available online, they complete the MPH requirements in the first three or four months of their internship. And so I imagine a similar sort of arrangement could be made for students who wanted to undertake an MBA. So there's a question um, from someone called Melissa who is interested in following a Doctors Without Borders type of career path. So I presume by that, Melissa, you mean a career in global health. Um, certainly there would be many opportunities throughout this course for you to engage in global health activities. You could, for example, uh, undertake a Masters of International Public Health concurrent with your medical studies. That will provide you with a very strong background in global health. And then you could also undertake your research project through the MD as part, of, um, as, as part of a global health group of students who are studying global health as their research project. Um, you could then spend part of your internship, uh, sorry, not your internship, your elective term doing global health. And so at the end of the course, could really have had a very global health experience at the same time as you honed your skills as a clinical doctor. 
There's some more admissions questions, so I'll hand over to Lily again. Hi, everyone. Yes, um, there are lots of questions about the admission test. So someone's asking about the MCAT and the, um, the valid date. So give you an example. Normally, MCAT would be valid for two to three years. For example, for 2015 entry, the MCAT result must be obtained between January 2012 and May 2014. So for 2016 entry, uh, the MK result must be obtained between January 2013 and May 2015, and et cetera. And also um, for uh, 2015 entry, as long as the students you uh, meet the minimum requirement, that means you got eight in each session of MK result, and you will be deemed for the interview as long as your GPA met the requirement. That's a credit average. It's a five out of seven, or for um, Northern American, more likely to be a mi B minus, or 2.7 out of four. And if you are sitting game set, for example, and that would be minimum requirement would be 50 in each session. And also um, the admissions committee um, is keeping a close eye on the change to the MCAT. We are aware of the changes. So um, we got some inquiries about what happened to the new MCAT results. And I can tell you now the um, missions committee is, um, is reviewing this issue because for the MCAT, the office, they just um, released all the information just recently. So as soon as we have a decision, we'll, the decision will be posted on the website. And how many international applicants apply from the 17 international applicants? So the question is how many international students apply for the, international, for the uh, 70 places? Um, oh. I think it's of the order of three or 400 typically, isn't it, Lily? Um, not all of them, of course, meet entry requirements. Um, in the end, we end up having about two or three times the number of international applicants as we're able to take. Extra points for graduate degrees in medical science, uh, master's of science or PhD. Okay, for um, the students who um, have been awarded a master by research or a PhD, and as long as their MCAT or game set result in the minimum requirement, they'll be deemed for an interview. And also for the PhD, we'll be given a three percentage point. However, um, you need to be aware that um, this rule is going to um, be discontinued. So the last cohort um, to have this rule will be uh, for 2015 entry and 2016 entry. So from 2016, student applying for 2017 entry, the PhD and master by research will no longer be deemed to be um, eligible for an interview. So you need to be aware of this. So just to reiterate, at the moment, if you have a master's by research or a PhD, you will automatically be interviewed. Um, whereas in, uh, as Lily has said, for entry into t uh, the course in 2017, that will no longer be the case. There's a question for Boris. Um, just received a question um, asking uh, in terms of uh, whether the university has provided research funding for posters and for travel. And I have been funded uh, from a few different sources. So uh, there's a Dean Scholarship Fund, uh, which generally applies for uh, travel to uh, conferences. I've uh, received money from that. I've also applied for a specific honours scholarship, which is the research uh, component that I'm doing as part of the MBBS program, and received funding through that. And I also received funding from uh, my specific research centre in order to travel to America. And I think that that's been the experience um, of my colleagues who've done research, that some funding has come directly from the medical school and others from uh, specific research centres. Thanks, Boris. Yes, I could just reiterate that we are keen to promote research, and obviously part of research is presenting your findings. So people who do have um, accepted poster or oral presentations at national or international meetings, we do strive to support you. 
Um, often, as Boris said, though, that, that funding is obtained either through the institute that you're working in, your supervisor, or the medical school. But somehow, we try to fund you to get to these meetings to present your data. At this stage, we don't have any plans to help prepare, prepare students for the Canadian board exams. Um, most of the students from Canada have been very keen to prepare for the USMLE, and so we've focused on that. If there is uh, increasing demand for students to prepare for the Canadian exams, then we'll consider that, but we don't have any firm plans to do so at the moment. International students who are accepted into a, an intern or residency program here have exactly the same have exactly the same internship as domestic students do. So the the internship in Australia is a general internship. Um, it's not specifically medicine or surgery or OBGYN or pediatrics. Students all have to do some medicine, some surgery, and some emergency medicine as part of their internship. And the internships are the same across the the country. The answer is yes, they are held over Skype for all international students. So the question was, are um, interviews held over Skype for international students? The answer is yes, we hold the interviews over Skype for all international students, even for international students who happen to be here in Sydney. For the um, for sake of fairness, we insist that those international students also are interviewed via Skype so that you're not disadvantaged if you're in North America or Canada or Europe or, or Southeast Asia. So students are concerned about the accreditation of our MD program in Singapore. Um, an application has been lodged to have our program um, accredited by the Singapore Medical Council. Um, we have been given very encouraging um, feedback about that um, and, and I've got to say we're very fortunate that the University of Melbourne paved the way for us in that regard and that's the reason that we are quite confident that our program will be accredited um, hopefully this year by the Singapore Medical Council. So students at, at the moment from Singapore are able to enrol in our old MBBS degree um, and then once the degree, the MD degree is accredited by the Singapore Medical Council, you'll be able to convert from being enrolled in the MBBS to MD. So you won't be disadvantaged. If, if the worst case scenario was that we weren't accredited within Singapore, you would still graduate from Sydney Medical School in four years with MBBS. But I've got to say I'd regard that as a major failure on my part if that were to happen. So a question for Boris, our student, was what sort of living expenses are we looking at if you want to live around Sydney? Um, it's a hard question to answer, as I'm sure you've probably read that some people regard Sydney as an expensive city. In terms of rent, it really varies. Um, there are some suburbs close to the university which are quite expensive and others which are um, cheaper. Um, so rent in the West can range from anywhere for, from 150 or 130 up to 300 a week per room. In terms of day-to-day -day expenses, again, that can vary. I ride my bike to university, which keeps my um, expenses down in that regard. Again, it depends on how much you, you know, choose to go out in Sydney, which is a lovely city to go out in, versus um, uh, you know, staying at home and cooking at home for yourself. The other thing to mention is that in third and fourth year, many students who are at other clinical schools choose to live closer to those clinical schools, such as Concord, Westmead, or Nepean, and living costs uh, tend to be noticeably lower there than in the inner west, especially in regards to rent. Uh, yeah, so the rough figure that I've been given is approximately 20,000 a year.
So the other question was, does the university provide priority housing for international students? And the answer is, unfortunately, we don't provide priority housing. Um, many of the colleges, the residential colleges, however, around the university are very keen to have international students as part of their student cohort. And so uh, if you look on the university's website, you can get links through to those colleges which are located on the campus of the university um, and you would make direct application to them. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that the cost of living in college is about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per year um, for the term time. That does include full board and your room. So the question is, what are the prospects for international students graduating with the MD? Well, international students will graduate with an MD the same as domestic students will graduate with an MD. Um, if you have obtained an internship here in Australia, then you would be able to apply for permanent residence and you would be considered equally, um, on an equal footing, um, with domestic students in applying for subsequent specialty training positions. Okay, I might actually ask Lily to answer that question about the MMI interview. Yeah, okay, so for the MMI, um, basically um, there's a five stations. So each station is seven minutes and you, it's a one on one um, interview. So you talk to this interviewer and then after seven minutes and you come out the, oh, sorry, you are Skype, so you don't, you don't move. Okay, <laughs> sorry, okay, and so after seven minutes, and then there will be two minutes break for the interviewer to mark. And then after that, and then another interview will turn up in front of your monitor. You can see another new interviewer. And then uh, we will ring a bell, once the bell ring, and then um, you will start your interview. And then of course you will see the, okay, I have to mention this. You will see your questions on your monitor. We're sending by Skype, and then you can, you just read the questions and to the interviewer to ensure that you get the right uh, question. Anyway, and then, so after you read through them and then you can start answer your questions. And then um, during the seven minutes and then there will be some prompt questions to help you to go through the, go into the right direction so you won't answer the, the, the question wrongly in a different direction. Anyway, and then um, sometimes the interview may um, finish the, before seven minutes and then the interviewer will tell you, okay, that's the end of the interview. And after that, and they may have a chat with you to see what's the weather like, or whatever, and what time is there. Sometimes it'll be midnight for some students. And okay, and after seven minutes and the, the bell will ring again and then um, you stop the interview and then the next interview will come out again, come up in front of you up to two minutes. So in total, it will be 45 minutes for the interview. But of course, sometimes there may be some problem with the sky, and then um, sometimes we may have to take longer. And, but no worries, if during the interview, during the seven minutes, if there's any problems, we may re-interview you for that session at the end of the uh, 45 minutes. So that's no problem. And sometimes um, um, the sky might be not so reliable for some students. And in that instance, we may call you to continue the interview. But no worries, if there's any problems, we may reschedule the whole interview for you. And however, we do require you to have some reliable connection, like a wired connection that's very important. I know right now the mobile phone is very convenient. Lots of students use the, the iPhone. However, that's not really reliable. So we prefer that. Ensure that you get a good quality of your interview. So you better use some wired connection. And also for the interview, those um, information is also available on the, um, on the website in the admissions guide. And then uh, you can read through them. If you have any questions, you are welcome to contact us. Thanks.
think it's fair to say that the interview itself is not meant to trick you. It's really meant to assess your ability to consider the range of issues that might affect a particular, often ethical, question that's been raised as part of the stem, or the, the, uh, the outline of the question that's put up on your screen. Yes, there are, there are many students each year in our course who do have a particular interest in Indigenous health. Um, we're fortunate that we do have uh, what is known as the Poach Centre for Indigenous Health within the faculty, funded by a very generous um, benefactor. Um, the Poach Centre runs outreach clinics into Indigenous communities where some of our members of faculty provide clinical services and students are able to participate in those clinical outreach services. Um, in addition, some students elect, if they're particularly interested in, indif in, in Indigenous health, to undertake their in elective term in an Indigenous community. So there are a number of opportunities throughout the course for you to uh, participate in Indigenous health education. So the, the question is, do students with a commerce or essentially a non-medical background have difficulty getting through the program? The answer is no. As Boris, I think, said during his talk, students really do help one another enormously. And in fact, we try to structure the um, problem and case-based learning groups so that there is a mix of science and non-science students within them, because that's been um, proven to be very effective in helping um, the non-science students quickly get up to speed with some of the basic biomedical science. Um, I might also add that the non-science students help, I think, enrich the education of the science students. So whether you've got economists or vets or lawyers within your group, each of those individuals brings um, an enormous contribution to the learning of the others. So the question was, would a work contract going beyond the projected start date for the course be an acceptable reason for deferring? Okay, if it's a medical related, we may consider. Um, for any reasons outside of those reasons I mentioned before, um, the admissions committee will process them on a case-by-case -case basis. So you're welcome to contact us. Yes. So if you have a specific requirement, um, contact Lily and the admissions committee will consider it, but generally um, a reason for a work deferral would have to be some ongoing medical, medically related experience or exposure that was going to contribute to your overall health education. So the question is what credits are available from previous degrees in the medical program? The answer is none. The medical program is a um, full-time program for which there are no credits given. Um, so we, we elected um, uh, some years ago to only grade the last two years of our program, that is years three and four. And the reason that we've done that uh, and not graded years one and two is because non-grading does facilitate the type of interaction and, and non-competition between students that's required um, for successful problem and case-based learning. We have introduced limited grading though in years three and four so that students can um, be competitive when they're subsequently applying for scholarships and fellowships um, uh, after graduation. But that's really the only reason that we've provided grading. Um, generally we feel that non-grading of students actually facilitates the interactive learning style that the medical program is renowned for. One quick question, how long is the elective term? The elective term can be up to approximately three months um, because it's, there is a holiday in the middle of it so that students can actually um, cobble together a total of um, nearly three months from uh, literally the beginning of November in one year through to the end of October, uh, sorry, through the end of, um, or middle of February um, they can undertake elective studies. 
So one last question. One last question. Um, how much emphasis is placed on enterprise selection versus enterprise selection? Okay, so this is a question on how much emphasis is placed on each part of the selection process. Um, as Lily has mentioned to you, the first um, uh, issue is that you have a credit average or better on your GPA. That's simply a hurdle. Subsequently, um, to, subsequent to uh, meeting that hurdle, the only two things that are considered are your MCAT or GAMSAT score and your interview score, which are each weighted 50% towards um, your final ranking for a place in Sydney Medical School. So if people have um, specific um, further questions, please forward them um, and, uh, and we'll attempt to answer them by email directly to you. And, and Felicity Barry will send everyone who's been registered um, for this webinar a copy of the presentation. So thank you all very much for participating um, this morning, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you may be. Um, good luck with your application and, and we are here to try to help you ultimately become good doctors and we hope you do get that opportunity. Thank you.